اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان العین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ اللذی جعلنا من المتمسکین بولایت امیر المؤمنین ولائمت المعصومین علیہم السلام والحمد للہ اللذی ہدانا لہذا وما کنا لنہتدی لولان ہدان اللہ والحمد للہ اللذی لا یبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يودي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا جل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته وودد بالصخور ميدان أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أستقول قائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد من الله على المؤمنين إذ بعث فيهم رسولا, رسولا من أنفسهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم على محمد وعلى محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. There is no doubt that it's due to His kindness and generosity that He gives us these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and in glorification of Him Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Then we begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi ma'afdalu salatu wa salam. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We'll begin many of his sermons by saying, Usikum ibadallah bi taqwallah that I beseech you, O the servants of God, to be God-conscious, God-fearing, and pious human beings. We have been discussing the Risalatul Hukuk, the treaties of rights that are set by our fourth Imam, alayhi salam, and we are focusing our attention currently on the first right, which is Haqqullahil Akbar. Allah, Imam, alayhi salam, when he's describing this right, he says, فَأَمَّا Haqqullahil Akbar فَإِنَّكَ تَعْبُدُهُ وَلَا تُشْرِكْ بِهِ شَيْئًا Then the greatest right of God incumbent upon you is that you worship Him without associating any partners to Him. We are trying to understand what it means to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last week we talked about two forms of ibadat or two forms of worship which are considered to be the best forms of worship. And the first is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that He has commanded. So whether I understand it, whether I like it, whether um, it makes sense to me or not, because God has told us to do it, I do it. And therefore that is the demonstration of my obedience to Him and it's a manifestation of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we talked about the second form of worship or a second way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is to express our gratitude and thanks to Him for everything that He has provided for us. Today we talk about a third manifestation of ibadat and this is to earn a halal livelihood. Yeah? Oftentimes we don't recognize or appreciate um, how um, the, the, the timing of our life can work where I can worship God because in our minds uh, worship has a specific form 
yeah? that it has to be on a musalla, for example, it has to have a turba or a misbah tasbih in my hand or something like that. But that's just one form of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we have clearly demonstrated by what we talked about before. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages seeking of sustenance. He says in the Holy Quran in the verse we recite every Jum'ah, فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ He says, and when the prayers are finished, disperse through the land and seek Allah's grace. Yeah, yani go out, earn a livelihood, but make sure that you do it while remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see that even in the Quran, in many other verses, there is this encouragement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go seek a halal livelihood. There are many benefits or many rewards associated with seeking a halal livelihood. A very famous tradition from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, Al-ibadatu sab'oona juz'an afdaluha talabul halal. That ibadat can be broken up into 70 parts and the best of those parts is seeking a halal livelihood. From the above, you know, not only is it clear and understood then that earning a halal livelihood is ibadat. It is considered to be a form of worship. In fact, you know, there are other traditions that tell us that ibadat can be broken up into ten parts and nine-tenths of that is seeking a halal livelihood. The one-tenth would be to do the acts of worship that we normally consider to be ibadat. And so we see that uh, not only is halal livelihood or seeking a halal livelihood uh, considered to be a form of ibadat, but what we can also infer from this, and I think this is something really important for us as a community, is that helping someone find a halal livelihood is also considered to be a form of ibadat. You know? And I think this is something that we as a community need to do more of that we need to help our fellow brothers and sisters locate employment. We need to help our brothers and sisters try to find better employment. And on top of that, you know, I think we need to do a better job of supporting our brothers and sisters who are in business so that they become more successful in their business. You find, um, for example, different communities, and we've mentioned these communities before. You look at the Jewish community, for example. They give their business to other Jews. You look at the Sikh community, if you just travel down a little bit on airport and you notice how they have everything, yeah, where they support themselves, whether it's buying furniture, buying groceries, whatever it is, they look after themselves. Unfortunately, you know, we Muslims, we like to, uh, we are afraid of something. I don't know what we're afraid of, to be quite honest, you know, it's maybe we think that, oh, they'll infringe on my privacy, you know, or something like that, but I think sometimes the... Uh, those in business have given us a bad name as well. You know, when they know that, oh, he's a, he's a fellow person, I can rip him off a little bit, you know. Um, you know, I've heard stories which are amazing stories, you know, that people had first moved here and they wanted to do some construction work in their house, so they hired somebody from the community to come and it turned out that they charged them six times more because they didn't know anything about it, right? It is these type of examples that we have that sometimes give us a bad taste or a bad feeling. But the reality is that for us to be successful and for us to be implementing this ibadat in our day-to-day -day lives, we have to help each other on both fronts. Those with businesses need to act with proper... Um, trust and proper akhlaq and those who are seeking things should reach out to people from their own business because that is a form of ibadat. I don't have to sit on a musalla. I can help people become more financially secure and in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is a form of worship. You know many people I meet lament over the fact that they don't get an opportunity to spend time in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way they want to worship Him. I mean, I can look at my own personal life, right? And the, I can honestly say that the way that I worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
when I was in the Hawza is far different than the way I am worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today. In the Hawza, more time was awarded to me, right? Where I could go to the Haram, I could sit in the Maqam and sit and recite many prayers that today there is unfortunately not as much time. And so the form of ibadat changes. But as long as we are out earning a halal livelihood, working hard, putting in a good day's effort, it matches that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do or that feeling that we have. I think the problem that comes into it is the feeling of it. You see, when I, for example, do a form of ibadah that is customary to me, that I know that, I can, I, that everybody enjoys or does together, right? like reciting a dua or praying a particular salah, I am left with the feeling of spiritual strength, for example. Right? Where I feel rejuvenated by doing this amal. But let's say I am doing something else, like I'm volunteering and I don't get a chance to do that amal. Or I'm out working and I don't get a chance to recite the extra prayers. I don't feel that spiritual rejuvenation. Rather, I feel tired at the end of the day. Yeah? I feel burnt out at the end of the day. But the feeling may be different. But the reward is the same. Yeah? And I think that's something that we need to accept. Right? And in fact, you know, traditions tell us that when one actually goes out and seeks a halal livelihood, that is far worthier in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than someone who spends all day on a musalla praying. Yeah? There are traditions, for example, this one comes to us from Nabi Isa alayhi salam where he says, Li rajulin, ma tasna, what are you doing? Faqala ata'abud, ata'abbad. He's like, I am worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقَالْ فَمَنْ يَعُودُ عَلَيْكَ He says, who takes care of your day-to-day -day things then if you're spending all day in ibadat? فَقَالْ أَخِي My brother looks after my financial affairs. فَقَالْ أَخُوكَ أَعْبَدُ مِنْكَ Your brother is a better servant than you are yeah, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's really important right, that we realize that yes, the life that we live here in the West is constantly driving us to work the commutes that we have to make for work and all of these things, as long as I am doing the wajibat and avoiding the muharramat in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then, my entire day is spent in ibadah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <coughs> Muhammad. The most important thing I think that we have to keep in mind, right, is that it must be a halal livelihood. Yes? Um, therefore, I can't get involved in shady business, right? I can't do things which are haram or shady and then thinking that, oh, subhanAllah, I worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't worship God with haram. We don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with shadiness, right? So it's really important that when everything that I do, I do it with pure sincerity. I do it with full heart and recognize that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is um, looking after my affairs. There's a verse in the Quran that talks about this where Allah says, Rijalun la tulhihimu tijaratu wa la bay'un an dhikrillah wa iqamus wa iqamis salah وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاءِ يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ He says that this verse is the verse of Noor, isn't it? It's right up here uh, on the ceiling. He says that there, these are men, the, the men who get the light of God. Yani they are people who neither um, their busyness or their trade, yani their business distracts them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? That means my business and everything that I do should be in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And when it's time for salah, I pause my business and I go pray salah. When something haram comes about, I pause that and I don't allow myself to do that. Because this is the way everything that I do then becomes a form of ibadat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wan. And Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Audu Billah, him in a shaitan, a regime, Smilah, Rahman, a Rahim, Kul Hua, who ahad, Allah, who summad, Lam Yalid, Walam Yulad, Walam Yakullah, who Kufu, and Nahad.
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان العین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ قاسم الجبارین مبیر الظالمین مدرک الحاربین نکال الظالمین سریخ المستصرخین موضع حاجات الطالبین معتمد المؤمنین اللہم صلی علی خاتم النبیین و سید المرسلین محمد محمد و آلی محمد و صلی علی سید الوسین امیر المؤمنین علی ابن ابی طالب وصلی علی الصدیقۃ الطاہرہ فاطمۃ الزہرہ سیدت نساء العالمین علی محمد و علی محمد وصلی علی سبت الرحمہ و امام الہدا الحسن والحسین سید شباب اہل الجنہ اللہم صلی علی محمد وصلی علی علی ابن الحسین و محمد ابن علی و جعفر ابن محمد و موسیٰ ابن جعفر و علی ابن موسیٰ و محمد ابن علی و علی ابن محمد و الحسن ابن علی و الحجت القائم المہدی صلی علی محمد و علی محمد صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير Last week we talked about the plight of the Shia in Afghanistan, in particular the Hazaras. Um, and this week I want to discuss another group um, of really oppressed and forgotten Shia, um, and that is our brothers and sisters of Nigeria. Uh, we received news that a few days ago um, of the death of Sheikh Qasim Umar Sokoto who was one of three people shot by Nigerian police uh, while peacefully protesting against the illegal detention of Sheikh Zagzaki in Nigeria. Um, the police opened fire and killed three people. He was injured in the leg. They took him to the hospital and he died uh, a few days later. Um, and they were there protesting the illegal occupation since we, the illegal detention of Sheikh Zagzaki. We know Sheikh Zagzaki had been arrested um, shot and arrested in 2015 along with his wife um, and as they were out there trying to have a political rally they were shot and they were killed. Sheikh Qasim was a learned teacher and an integ integral contributor to the Islamic movement um, of Nigeria and in his aim to bring a voice to the Shia people of Nigeria he suffered a lot of persecution. He was imprisoned violently from 2007 to 2014 under the, the administration of Wamako, the previous administration of the Sokoro state and he was released in 2014 and he met his Shahadat in 2017. Let's remember him and all of the oppressed throughout the world with Al-Fatiha. <laughs> The Shia of Nigeria have been suffering for a long time. You know, we, when we talked about the Hazaras last week, we said that they are, if we go back historically, they could be the oldest non-Arab Shias um, in existence, basically, going back all the way to Imam Ali salam's time. While the, the Shias of Nigeria are, are fairly new Shias, right? Um, if you look at their history, if you look at the population of Nigeria, they say that the current population of Nigeria is about 186 million people, um, with nearly 50% of them being Muslim. Out of that 186 million people, the Shias make up anywhere from 5 to 10 million of that population. Um, so about 5% or 7% of the entire population of Nigeria. Um, and interestingly, they are the most 
they are regarded as the most populated Shia group in entire Africa. That means in Africa you will not find a larger group of Shias in one place than you will in Nigeria. Um, their uh, belief or their acceptance of the Shia madhab traces back to the late 1970s when Sheikh Zagzaki, who was who's the founder of the Islamic movement of Nigeria, um, he as uh, basically it, it fell in line with the Islamic revolution of Iran. And once that revolution happened, he was inspired by it. He went to Iran, he studied, he came back and he began converting. And he was able to convert, as we said, nearly 10 million people to follow the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt. That's a tremendous work that this one individual um, has done. And outside of Iraq, Nigeria is said to have the largest Arba'in procession anywhere in the world. You can go back and look at YouTube videos that are there. Millions of people come out and they walk in the streets of Nigeria. Our brothers and sisters there are, are quite oppressed and we need to make sure that we remember them. You know, this, is, this shooting of Sheikh uh, Sokoto was not the first shooting that has happened in Nigeria. Um, but this goes back for many, many years now. And just two incidents that I want to raise. The first was in July of 2014, the Nigerian army fatally shot 35 followers of Sheikh Zakzaki, uh, including three of his sons, um, at a pro-Palestinian rally that was being held in Zaria. So in 2014, he lost three of his sons. In 2015, again, the army attacked the, the followers there and they shot and killed hundreds of people in that particular you remember this incident that happened not too long ago and in that his three remaining sons were also killed so Sheikh Zagzaki in this light in this plight you know has lost all six of his sons um, for the cause of the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim was um, his wife has been imprisoned with him since 2015 um, and really they are a Muslim state where they are not allowed to go out and, and um, really be practicing Shias, something that we again have to be really appreciative of, that the fact that we have this ability, we can hold processions and not be feared of being shot at and these type of things. It's important that we give light to these type of incidents throughout the world, to give light to our fellow brothers and sisters who are suffering. Um, inshallah, there may be some amongst us who can have some effect, but at the most part, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters everywhere throughout the world, um, especially those who are forgotten, yeah, and those who are not remembered as often as other places are remembered. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives freedom to Sheikh Zagzaki and all the Shias of Nigeria, and for all the Shias throughout the world who are oppressed, may Allah relieve their oppression, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم